CNN 10 on this Wednesday, January 27th. I'm Carl Azus. Thank you for taking 10 minutes for us. Severe weather in the American Southeast leads off today's show. As we put this program together, a search and rescue operation was underway in the U.S. state of Alabama. On Monday night, a deadly storm tore through the town of Fultondale, a northern suburb of Birmingham. It killed at least one person and injured dozens of others. Fultondale's fire chief said 17 people there were taken to the emergency room for different injuries, and some of those are critical. One witness told Al.com that it looked like a bomb had gone off in the town of 9,000 people, causing serious damage to almost all of the homes there. One county official said there wasn't much warning. The storm spawned a tornado described as large and extremely dangerous. It ripped up a hotel, tore off part of a church's roof, struck a high school, damaged or destroyed homes and businesses, and scattered power lines and debris across the roads. The mayor of Centerpoint, another Birmingham suburb, reported quite a bit of damage in his city of 16,000 people. And while he said that Tuesday would be a long day of assessing damage and covering up places where walls, roofs, or windows were missing, he was grateful that there were no injuries in Centerpoint. Schools were closed in the region. Survivors said they were grateful to be alive and that the community was pulling together to help one another. The storm system prompted tornado watches and warnings in Alabama and Georgia as it made its way across the region. And as it turned north, it was expected to bring heavy snow to the mid-Atlantic coast on Tuesday night. When severe weather strikes, one of the most common questions we get, what's the difference between a watch and a warning? Well, just for comparison's sake, let's take this stoplight. Green light, yellow light, red light. Sometimes the National Weather Service will issue a hazardous weather outlook, an advisory. Treat this as a green light. Know that the possibility of rough weather is there, but go about your day as you would. Just stay alert. But as conditions tend to ripen, we may see a tornado watch issued by the National Weather Service. Use this with more caution. This means conditions are favorable for tornado development, and so you need to know what you should do in case a tornado strikes. That's where the warning comes in. If the radar has indicated a tornado or someone has spotted a tornado in progress, that's when the tornado warning is issued and you should get to your safe place immediately Stop what you're doing and seek shelter. I'm Matt Rivers in Manaus, Brazil, a city in the middle of the Amazon rainforest where the health system has all but collapsed due to a particularly brutal second wave of COVID-19 going on right now. As a result, the local government has imposed a seven-day lockdown banning all non-essential activity, which is why streets like this one behind me, normally quite crowded, are now quite empty. And this comes at a particularly fraught time for Brazil overall, which in recent days has seen some of its highest daily death counts from the coronavirus since the pandemic began. I'm Salma Abdulaziz in London. Health Secretary Matt Hancock has said this is not the moment to ease restrictions. His comments came after new data showed that infection rates are beginning to slow, but the key indicators are still very poor. Hospitalization rates are high. There's more people on ventilators now than there were during the first wave of the pandemic. Authorities are concerned about variants around the world. That's why hotel quarantines are being considered by officials. And of course, the vaccination program. Millions more people need to be vaccinated before these restrictions can be lifted. I'm Cyril Vanier in Paris. European countries are furious at pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca after it announced that it would be delivering far fewer doses of its vaccine to the EU than expected, delaying its rollout until the end of March. The European Health Commissioner says drug makers working on the continent will now have to notify the bloc before exporting vaccines out of Europe. The EU had pre-ordered and pre-financed 400 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is expected to be approved by the European Medicines Agency here on Friday. I'm Dave McKenzie in Johannesburg. Dr. Anthony Fauci says that vaccines in their current form should be effective against variants discovered of COVID-19 here in South Africa and the UK. Now that good news is backed up by Moderna, though they say their vaccine could be slightly less effective against the South African variant, and they are developing a booster shot. Now, despite this good news, President Biden has extended the travel restrictions to the US to include South Africa, which has been dealing with a dramatic second wave pushed by this more transmissible variant. 10 second trivia. 
Which of these dog breeds is believed to be the oldest? Afghan Hound, Alaskan Malamute, Border Collie, or Chihuahua? Many scientists believe the Afghan Hound originated in Afghanistan in around 6,000 BC, making it the oldest breed on this list. There's widespread disagreement over what the oldest breed in the world is. Some scientists say it's the Akita Inu, the Basenji, or the Chinese Saluki. And while the relationship between people and dogs is known to go back thousands of years, researchers don't know exactly when or why dogs became domesticated as man's best friend. But there are some new theories about this, and a related study was just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. What researchers did was compare genetic information gathered from ancient human remains with the info gathered from ancient dog remains. They say that some of the dogs found in the Americas have lineage that can be traced back to ancient Siberian dogs. So from that, they concluded that when people migrated from Northeast Asia to the Americas, the dogs came with them. Scientists believe this happened more than 15,000 years ago over the Bering Land Bridge, which no longer exists. The study's lead author theorized that the dogs could have helped the people carry their goods faster, and she suggested that people and dogs might have gotten together in the first place when humans allowed wolves to eat whatever food people threw away. There's no definitive proof of this, but researchers are hoping to search for older dog bones in the region of Siberia to get more evidence. So I guess you could say that some scientific studies have gone to the dogs. Hey, speaking of dogs, it's America's first dogs that are the subject of our last story today. Champ and Major have arrived at the White House. They're the canine best friends of President Joe Biden. Former President Donald Trump didn't have pets at the White House during his term. He was the first president since Andrew Johnson not to. Former President Barack Obama got Bo during his first term and Sonny came along four years later. And former President George W. Bush had Barney, Miss Beasley, and a cat named India. The truth is, cats and dogs haven't been the only pets at the president's residence. Calvin Coolidge also had quite the menagerie. A bobcat, a pygmy hippo named Billy, lion cubs, and even a raccoon. William Taft had a cow named Pauline, the last cow to graze on the White House lawn. You could say President Theodore Roosevelt had a zoo of sorts at his White House. Parrots, bears, zebras, and yes, a one-legged chicken. But dogs have certainly been the most popular. President Warren G. Harding's dog Laddie Boy was the first, first dog to be regularly covered in the national press. Herbert Hoover had a dog he called King Tut. Franklin D. Roosevelt's Scottish Terrier was named Falla. A statue of Falla is featured beside Roosevelt in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C., the only presidential pet with such an honor. George W. Bush had Barney, Bill Clinton, Buddy. Gerald Ford had a golden retriever named Liberty. Lyndon Johnson brought beagles named him and her to the White House. JFK had a dog named Pushinka, a gift from the Soviet premier. So it seems that many American leaders had pet projects, animals that were catapulted into the national spotlight, companions that helped menageries the pressures of office when their masters got dog tired. Some cats with nine lives got to spend one in the first house. And even if all dogs go to heaven, who would have thought some would go from the doghouse to the White House? It's puppy food for thought, y'all. Our newest shout-out school is in the state of New Hampshire. Groveton High School is in the community of Groveton. It's great to see you guys. There is only one way to get your school mentioned on our show. Please subscribe to youtube.com slash CNN10 and leave a comment on our most recent show there. I'm Carl Azus.